Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 501 of the Juice Box Podcast. Hey, everyone, welcome back. Today, we're going to be speaking with Danae. Danae is a young adult living with type 1 diabetes. She's had it for a decade, and she's here to tell us her story. Please remember while you're listening that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your health care plan or becoming bold with insulin. That was such an unfair introduction to this episode because it goes in a wonderful direction and fills a lot of little gaps in your heart, but I can't give it all away here during the music, right? You got to listen to the episode, which I'm going to call, hmm, see, I want to call it Alone in a Room Full of People. Alone in a Full Room, I got to make it a little, Alone in a Room Full of People. All right, that's what I'm going to call it. It's not catchy, but it fits. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor. I want you to go to Dexcom.com forward slash juice box to learn more about the Dexcom CGM. Getting that information, that data, that stuff that you can see in real time It's a game changer. The podcast is also sponsored by the Omnipod. You can get a free, no obligation, 30-day trial, if you're eligible, of the Omnipod Dash at omnipod.com forward slash juice box. You could just use a pump for free for a month if you're eligible. That is at least worth checking out. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Here's the name. I am Danae. I'm from Boston, Mass. I'm 24, and I was diagnosed when I was 14. 10 years. Yeah, it'll be 10 years in May. So, decade. Feel like a big thing or not particularly? Do you not count it like that? Um, Yeah, I don't know. 10 years is a lot. I haven't really made like a big thing of a the diversity, I guess. Um, maybe like the last few years I have just because it's been more of like a better thing. Um, but I think 10 years will be a big thing for sure. All right, today, what the hell are you touching? Uh, it was my, uh, <laughs> what is it? Uh, I AirPod case. I'm not touching it anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have a glass table. That's probably why I make so much noise. And I don't want you to be sorry. I think it's really common in the first 15 or 20 minutes of the episode. People are jittery and yeah. a lot of people touch things um, to it's it's really interesting. But yours is really loud for some reason. So uh, squeeze your knee or something like that. I'm sitting on my hands now. <laughs> <laughs> Today, are you sitting on your hands for real? I really am. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. You know, it's funny. The um. The way the show starts traditionally where people are like, hi, my name is Danae and blah, blah, blah. You know, that actually came from the first time I couldn't. All right, I'm going to admit something now. Um, So it came from the first time I started recording with someone and couldn't remember their name. Oh, really? So (laughs) as an artful way to get around not knowing someone's name, I said, hey, just introduce yourself real quick. (laughs) (laughs) that's funny i like it (laughs) and then it became such a nice way to start the show where someone just comes on and says hey i'm steve and you know but like that i was like i really like that but it it absolutely came from my my own embarrassment and me trying to cover up for myself so i like it i like it (laughs) um and thank thank god i did that because now six years later your name i probably would have gotten wrong if i tried to pronounce it I don't it's know why. Pretty, it's so pretty common. You're not. You wouldn't be the first one. <laughs> but now it's a tough one. <laughs> it's so obvious now that you said it. But looking at it, like all morning, I was like, oh, "My God, I think this is a woman." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've gotten so many different variations, so <laughs> it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been the first time. <laughs> cool. So, what made you reach out? 
Um, so I started actually listening to your podcast in January of this year. I had just started a job at Mass General and I was taking the train in. So I kind of wanted to find something to listen to on the train. And I just happened to stumble upon the Juice Box podcast. And I was like, wow, this is like the best podcast I've found. And um, it literally like changed my life. I did not have a good A1C. I was just not really taking care of myself that well. And then six months later, my A1C went from 13 to seven and it just completely changed my life. And I just will not listen to anything else ever. So so I just wanted to come on and just say thank you for everything that you do. And honestly, like just come on and say that. And really it's just like amazing how, just listening to something can just impact somebody's life so much. And somehow if like my story could change someone's life as yours did and so many other people's stories did, that would like even just one person like that would be incredible. I agree. It is a very big deal to do something that impacts someone else's health. Um, It feels amazing. So you're going to do that. You're going to tell your story and somebody else is going to find something interesting about it. But let's first come to, I just came to a realization. So let's talk about this first. I'm always joking about people naming a baby after me as tribute, but Mm -hmm. why don't I start asking to be named in the, in the life insurance? Really? This is, this is what I should be doing. I just, I I can't believe I've been wasting this effort on get a, getting a baby named Scott. I don't even like my own name. All right. From now on, if people feel like I'm saved them, I would like to be included in their life insurance policy or 401k payouts or anything at all. Really? That's what I'm, that's now what I'm going to ask for. You're too young. You'll outlive me by a lot. So maybe you could just give me a baby named Scott one day, Danae. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm incredibly uncomfortable uh, and happy at the same time. It's a very, it's a very weird blend of feelings to have someone say to you, I found your podcast. I thought it was great. Changed my life. Um, It's hard to know how to respond to that. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, really is. So I make really bad jokes instead. Although one (laughs) of you. That's a great coping mechanism, honestly. (laughs) That's all I got. Danae, I grew up a fat kid. I had nothing else. What was I going to (laughs) do? You know, Um, I had to be funny. They would have beat my ass if I wasn't funny. I grew up in the, (laughs) I was, I grew up in the seventies and and the early eighties. You needed to be funny if you weren't athletic. Or willing well, to get sure, high sure. Or was going to go down tonight. Do you know what I mean? Like you right, were, right. you're going to be the. You know, how like you watch movies now, and you're like, oh, stuffing people in lockers. What a trite idea that doesn't. Oh, it happened. It really happened, and <laughs> I wasn't looking for it to be me. Um, but, but seriously, congratulations. Tell me again where your A1C was and where it went to in a year, less than a year. It's six months. Yeah, it was at thirteen, and it went to seven. But not 13, mm-hmm. like just diagnosed. Like you had diabetes for nine years and it was 13. Yeah. Holy shit. It's been from, it was, had been anywhere from like nine to 13. And just that this past couple of years, like before the pandemic and everything, mm-hmm. um, my family had gone through a lot of things. And so it was just really hard to keep everything under control. And so, I just wasn't really the best at doing the best, you know, and it just ended up being higher than I wanted it to be. And then one day I kind of just found the podcast and I kind of even like freaked myself out into taking care of myself where I was like, if I don't do this, I'm literally going to go blind. And I kind of just like gave myself the fear factor and was like, okay, I need to do something about this. And then once I just kept listening, I was like, all these people are doing so well. Like if they can do it, I definitely can do it. Like if anyone can do it, so can I. So then I was like, you know what? I have all these tools and all these resources. And like, I also use the Omnipod and the Dexcom. So I have access to all these things and like it's easy just do it 
Wow. So then I just did it. <laughs> so you're making a lot of uh, points that I'm interested in. Um, mm-hmm. First of all, I got to get this out of the way before we start. You're not from Boston, obviously. Are you from the South? I'm not. No, I'm from Boston. Wait, you're from Boston with that accent that you have right there? I have an accent? <laughs> well, well, no, you have the lack of an accent. Not that like it would be from a movie where you know it's all oh. like on the yard and stuff like that. But I'm just saying like... You really, I thought you were from more like Virginia and had moved up. Oh, oh, so my mom was born and raised in France. And when, so I spoke French growing up. So I don't actually have like a Boston accent. No, you certainly Um, don't. Okay. All right. Uh, So that's just to get that out of the way so that I don't spend the entire interview thinking like, where is she from? Uh, So, okay. So somebody taught you how to speak English um, properly. (laughs) (laughs) do you still speak french at all sorry do you still speak any french i do yes all right at the end we're gonna do stuff with that okay um okay (laughs) so so you you proved out and i think a lot of people listening have but a theory that i've had for a long time so if you've been listening you know that i wrote a blog for like a decade in the Mm -hmm. in the diabetes space before i started doing this and honestly as you and i are recording this in a couple of weeks, the seventh, I think, yeah, the seventh season of the podcast is going to start in a couple of weeks. And I'm not like, mm-hmm. I don't do what those other, some of those other podcasts do. Like, you know, they've been out for three years. And they're like, we're on episode, we're on season 12. And I'm like, what? You, you know, like they put out five episodes and call it a season or whatever. When I tell you that this podcast is starting its seventh season, it's starting its seventh year of being at least a weekly show. And yeah, that's incredible. It, well, please, it's it's not that incredible. It's just I sit and talk to people and then I put it. It's not that hard. Uh, but um, but I appreciate it. But what my point is, is that the overwhelming theory online, the, with, during blogging, in the time I was blogging heavily, and even when I started the podcast was, you don't show other people with diabetes, people who are doing well, because that makes them feel bad. Yeah, and I've yeah. never agreed with that. I've always thought that aspirational was the way to go, that you look at someone and just think they're not doing better than me. They just they know something I don't know. Let me find out what that is. Mm-hmm. And, and that is what happened to you, huh? Yeah, because diabetes is a learning curve. Like there's always something else to learn. There's there's doing it and then there's knowing something else that somebody else doesn't know exactly. Like that's what you just said. Yeah, but you can't do something you don't, understand like i i said the other day um and i saw somebody echo it online the that you can't fail at something you have no knowledge of exactly yeah right? and and so we want to not give so the 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 prevailing idea was don't teach them anything and they'll figure it out but what they were seeing back was that most people don't figure it out and i always thought why don't we just i mean listen first of all i was lucky <clears throat> had the time to really look at it and to figure it out. I was a stay at home parent, right? So I could take a long look, a hard look, sometimes a micro, sometimes a macro and figure things out and come up with ideas. And, you know, I only learned to talk about them because of the blog. Uh, But most people don't even have that time. They're off at work or they're at school. They're just like staying alive. It's like, it's a constant, just tell me about that. Tell me about those first nine years. Like what, what was your life like? When I first got diagnosed, I was 14, so I had just started high school. Um, And it's funny, I remember other people telling me what it was like for me, but I don't really remember it for myself, which is weird, Um, because I didn't know I was really feeling bad until I started feeling better. And... So I had all the typical signs of it, but not really many people in my family kind of knew what it was. They just knew something was wrong. So I had like the extreme thirst, extreme hunger, weight loss, hair loss, everything. And then by the time I was diagnosed, I was 82 pounds. And the doctors were like, we don't even know how you're alive right now. Mm -hmm. And that I remember that like clear as day, like that was probably the one of the most memorable things. And the reason I went into the hospital actually was because I was getting headaches 
or the doctor's office, actually. I went to the doctor's because I was getting headaches and they were like, oh, we're just going to like run some tests and stuff. So then we had left and they called and were like, you need to go to the emergency room right now. And we were like, oh, why? And they were like, you have diabetes. It was funny because I never really had like crazy reactions to things until I kind of understood them. So my first reaction to was, oh, well, at least it's not cancer. And that was my first reaction to hearing that I had diabetes. So I never really like was like, oh, it's not like I didn't understand how bad I was feeling until I felt better. So I was when I was in the hospital, I started really grasping it. And I was like, oh, crap this is really what it is. And they give you like the diabetes 101 crash course in four days. And you're like, okay, so here's your new life. Have fun. Bye. And then they just give you your whole new set of rules for the rest of your life in a matter of hours. And then when you get home, you're like, okay, so now this is what it is. And that's really when it kind of started setting in Hmm. that, everything was going to be different. And then... I find that, Danae, to be dangerous. And it, it's understandable what happens. Yeah. They obviously, they can't tell you the whole world in a couple of days. Yeah. But that, but when you're in that situation, at least this is how I felt, everything that was said to me felt like a set in stone rule. And this yeah, is how it's... I agree. Right, right. Like this is how everything has to be all the time. There was never any buddy who would pull me aside and go, Hey, look, this is going to morph. It's going to change. You're going to need to be flexible. Like, you know, I know we said here one, two, this many carbs, but you know, over time you'll see that change. All of this is momentary. And if they would have just let me know that I know for like, I'm not blaming anyone. I'm saying that if, if I would have had that information, I wouldn't have spent so many years trying to make this elusive disease fit a very specific narrative. And um, that's where the maddening part comes to me is, is the trying to make it fit exactly the thing that was said to you on day one when you were 14, yeah. right? And, like, Cause I bet you when you were 16, you were a completely different person than you were when you were 14. Yeah. They made it almost like a cookie cutter thing. And I was like, this is not the same as it was. Right. Like I remember specific, like I would make my lunches for school and I was like, I need to have 15 pita chips and this many of this and that many of that. And I can only have eight ounces of juice and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, this is probably like, this isn't normal. Like it was the weirdest thing ever. And then going to school, like my friends before, like when you go to eat lunch, like, you know, people would share lunch and everything. Like people would be like, Oh, can I have a chip? And I'm like, no, you can't have one or I'll die. Like, it's just like, so cut and clean and in set in stone that you had to have everything perfect. And that's just not how you live your life. Because as everyone who has diabetes knows, diabetes is far from perfect. Isn't it kind of almost funny too, that you feel like, oh, I'm doing everything exactly the way I was taught, but your A1C was over nine. Yeah. Right. But you probably never put those two things together because you were doing what you were taught. Exactly. Yeah. And it's always like you're trying so hard and the numbers still are just not adding up. And that led to like a lot of different things down the road for me too, which also led to higher A1Cs and everything. So it just was like a constant struggle and like a battle. So it was just hard all the time. So you guys were basically, which one was, excuse me, was one of your parents helping you with management or was it just for you to do? Um, So I have always been a very extremely independent child (laughs) and I, my parents insisted on helping, but I insisted on doing it a lot of my own, like Mm -hmm. a lot on my own. Um, My mom was the one that helped more or I would a lot of the, well, she was kind of more involved, I guess. Um, She would come to the appointments with me and um, 
we would kind of relay the information to my dad and um, cause he's a teacher. So he was at school a lot and everything. Um, but my mom worked from home most of the time. <clears throat> and. Um, well, today was when, mm-hmm. when you say your mom was at the appointments, but when you got home and it was time to have an apple or 15 pita chips or something like that, was she helping you with that? Or were you just on your own? Um, so it was kind of like the appointment high, I guess you go to the appointment and then like the surrounding days of the appointment, my mom would be like, all right, this is what you have to do. This is what you have to do. Cause she was there and she was in it and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's, it's like the week after y'all decide to go on a diet together when, when a bunch of people, like when you get together with family and you're like, we could go on a, do a weight loss challenge. We'll all try to lose 10 pounds. And then by Tuesday, you're like, I'm going to lose 10 pounds. And then by Saturday, you're like, I'm just going to go to a bar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Gotcha. Yeah, it's like because at the end of the day, they don't actually have diabetes, and I do. So I'm like, okay, fine. Like, I still have to do this, though. Like, you can, like, you can say that you want to do it, but you don't actually have to do it. Like, I actually have to do this. Yeah. So, and like, obviously, there's no like blame on anything of it, but they're much older. Like they have a lot more responsibility and like different responsibility. And like, I actually have it. So it just like is what it is, but I've always been an independent person too. So I never placed any responsibility on them for it either. So I was just like, I can do it. Like it's, it's me. I can do it. And as a kid, you're like, I'm invincible. I can do it and I can do anything I want at the same time. So it probably was more than I like. I probably bit off more than I could chew. Were you a bit of a pain in the ass? Like, did you like, were they trying to help and you kept them at arm's length? Oh, absolutely. Gotcha. I was so stubborn. <laughs> okay. Um, Was. Yes, I still am. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I always wanted to do it by myself. And I was like, I can do it and I can do it by myself. Oh, I was definitely a pain in the ass. <laughs> Arden has to take a, a supplement like once a week. It's just a vitamin. And mm-hmm. it took me four days to get her to take it. <laughs> I just, it's just, a, I must've said, Hey, take that vitamin real quick. Like 5,000 times. I put it in front of her. Arden, can you just take that for, I don't like to take pills. I'm like, yeah, no one does. Can you just take it, please? <laughs> you know, and, like, and on and on. And at one point uh, last night, she comes up, I was editing the show and putting a show up last night. Mm-hmm. And she comes upstairs and she just got done writing something for her AP Lang class. And she's like, can you read the conclusion with me and see what you think? And I was like, sure. So we started reading. And as I was reading, I said, uh, hey, did you take that vitamin? And she started laughing. And she's like, I did. And I was like, are you sure? And she's laughing. I did. I did. I promise. And at this point, she had actually taken it, but had told me she was going to and not taken it for so many days in a row that by the time she actually took it, she was cracking up laughing. And then she was worried that I didn't believe her because she was laughing. And I understand what you're saying about. That's hilarious. It, yeah. Well, it's something about having somebody tell you to do something that you just don't want to do it. <laughs> right. No, no. It's 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 a, a completely common response. But the but the issue ends up being, and you know what, you freaked me out, but because I just sat here and did the math on the calendar, not that it was tough math, but you were diagnosed in 2012. Is that 11. right? 2011. That, like, you understand that 2011, like, I thought there'd be flying cars in 2011. Like, that's how old right? I am, right? Like, and you're you were 14 then. Even mm-hmm. just now, like, like putting together in my head that you're 24. Like it flips me out. Like you, like you were, weren't diagnosed. Uh, what do I mean? You're an adult with type one who wasn't diagnosed in the dark ages of type one, and yet you still had an A one C over nine. Mm-hmm. I I want you and to even, go ahead. Like even as much as the technology has changed, it still feels like so much has changed. Like even just nine years ago, it still feels like there was so much that has changed. But what it's making me think is that everyone listening needs to understand that the technology or the tools or whatever you want to call it, where, you know, how you always hear people say, like, this is the best time to be diagnosed with type one. I say that because it's true, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not true if someone doesn't teach you how to do it. Exactly. Right. And and so because you should not, uh, you obviously can do it because you're doing it. Yeah. 
right? And so you lack something for nine years that was there and attainable. Um, mm-hmm. And that's sad to me. I also am really excited for you that you found the other side of it. But in a larger way, it makes me worried for everyone else who, you know, you're going to see all these algorithms just existing in the world with pumps and algorithms and glucose monitors. And I, you know, Arden uses one and I know how well it works, Mm -hmm. but you just made me realize that it doesn't matter because most people aren't going to do it. Yeah. If we don't drag them forward into it and teach them how to do it so that they can do it on their own. People Mm -hmm. aren't just going to pick it up on their own. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, tell me a little bit about those those first years, especially as you got into your late teens and your early 20s. You are aware that your A1C is way higher than you want it to be. I assume you're trying or were you just not trying at all? What was the vibe? Yeah. So I went through a lot of difficult times growing up in diabetes because a lot of me didn't really want to have diabetes, I really got it at a time where you don't really know who you are yet. So you're kind of figuring out all of that and getting it when people are just kind of figuring out who you are. And then all of a sudden realizing you have this thing that makes you different. You're just like, I don't want this because no one else has it. And I think that kind of just really set me apart. And so I just avoided it for a really long time. And I did the bare minimum. And so that definitely contributed to a high A1C for a long time. And the beginning parts of all of the rules and regulations around like knowing what to eat, when to eat, how much to eat, And like carb counting and the like sliding factors and all of that, or like sliding scales and all of that, um, contributed to me developing an eating disorder as well. So I had, um, I'm sure you've heard of it before, but diabulimia Mm -hmm. and that, um, happened for a really long time. And um, my senior year of high school, actually, I ended up going into treatment for it, um, not for very long, um, and in a terrible place, which just did not know anything about diabetes, which is also one of the things that I want to like advocate for Mm -hmm. is just no like going to build awareness around places for um, in treatment and in patient treatment centers to build up awareness for diabetes around like places like that, because my experience with that was just so awful that they just have no education around that. And like, I was told that there was a place that place was for people like myself who have di- who had diabulimia and then just going in there and realizing that they had absolutely no idea what they were doing. Like they had the most bare minimum knowledge of it mm-hmm. was like, I was so shocked and mm-hmm. it was just like crazy to me that they just didn't know what they were doing. Well, when you said that to make sure not to do it in a bad place, I thought you were about to like Sean Boston. Friends, have you been using injections forever and been dreaming about a pump, but you look at the pumps and you think, oh, I don't want all that tubing and to be connected to something. I understand that. If you don't want tubing and you don't want to be connected, but you'd like the freedom that a pump would bring you, check out the Omnipod. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box, a tubeless insulin pump. Right now, eligible folks are being offered a free, no obligation, 30-day trial of the Omnipod Dash. Oh my, free for 30 days, Scott. Do tell. Well, there's not much to tell. You go to omnipod.com forward slash juice box. You find out if you're eligible and then they give you the pump. 
It's pretty cool. You get to use it for a full month and see what you think. Now, why would you do that? Well, it's summertime. Summertime. There's a song called Summertime, and I don't know how it goes. Anyway, it's an old song. It's really good. You should try it. Not the point. It's summertime. So you're going to be outside, active, running about, swimming, jumping, frolicking. What a great time to try out the Omnipod. What a great time to cut yourself free of tubing if you're on a tube pump or having to carry around a bunch of needles or a pen if you're doing MDI. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. My daughter's been wearing an Omnipod since she was four years old. She's going to be 17 in a couple of weeks. We love it and we think you might too. You know something else you might love? The Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor. Why is that, Scott? I'm talking to myself a lot during these ads today. Well, Scott, I'll tell you why. Now I'm just having a conversation with myself, which really is what this is, but that's not the point. The point is the Dexcom lets you know what direction your blood sugar is moving, how fast it's moving in that direction, and what the number is at a glance, literally at a glance. Like I pick up my cell phone right now. I have an Apple. You might have an Android. Wouldn't matter. I push a button. My daughter's blood sugar is 81 and it's stable. What do you think of that? Boom. Like that. I'm actually following somebody else right now. Their blood sugar is 120. That's right. You could follow more than one person. As a matter of fact, if you were a Dexcom user, you could allow up to 10 people to follow you. What? I know. It's crazy. But it's true. Technology is amazing. It's 2021, and this stuff just keeps getting better and better. The Dexcom is no exception. See your blood sugars in real time, their direction, their speed, and where they are with the Dexcom G6. You can do it for Apple or iPhone, and by do it, I mean you can follow with Apple or iPhone. Uh, you can also use it. I mean, Dexcom will give you a receiver if you want, but you can just see the blood sugar on your phone. My daughter can see hers on her iPhone, and she does. It's amazing. It's life-changing. Seeing what your blood sugar is doing, what direction it's moving in, it helps you make decisions about insulin, better decisions that lead to better outcomes. That's my opinion, but I think you'll find the same. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Give yourself a fighting chance. Don't just be throwing darts in the dark, thinking like, oh, I think this is as much insulin as I need, or spend the next three hours after a bolus for a meal going, I hope my blood sugar's not low. I hope my blood sugar's not high. Stop hoping. Try knowing. It makes it a lot easier. All right, guys. There are links to these sponsors and all the sponsors at juiceboxpodcast.com or right in the show notes of your podcast player. But for now, omnipod.com forward slash juicebox, dexcom.com forward slash juice box support the sponsors support the show where is she going with this uh but (laughs) but i hear i hear what you're saying you need a reputable place that is well versed has a plan. You should check on what that plan is before you go in. But again, tough because you don't know what they're supposed to be doing. So how do you check them on whether or not they know their, and it's going to be references. It's going to be. Yeah. Right. Reviews. Well, it's just their specific center. Like, yeah. but, um, there, it was just, I wasn't even in there for very long, but it was recommended by the hospital that I had, been diagnosed at and so i was like Mm, what is the affiliation between these and how is their connection with them like how much do they keep up with it do they supply them with their own doctors do they educate them do how often is their training like i it was like all of the stuff that i was thinking about the whole time and it was just weird to see it from my side as a diabetic and then seeing it also in the perspective of someone who had an eating disorder. So I had both sides yeah, and then just kind of putting the two and two together where they only have half of the treatment. Whereas somebody who has more than one thing going on, but I'm just only one side of that. Like what if somebody else had something completely different? Mm. And no. they're only getting half a treatment. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it, listen, healthcare is a business 
and not oh. not every business is run well. You know what I mean? And and it, it's interesting how how we think about it. Like if you have a storefront, a sign, well then, and you say you make sandwiches, then there are going to be good sandwiches inside here. And then you go buy mm-hmm. one, and you're like, oh, it's terrible. Um, you know, it turns out everybody can't make a great sandwich, but it doesn't stop them from owning a, owning a sandwich shop. That's uh, true. Yeah. So you you have to do some diligence, but it's also interesting that you're in a bad way to begin with. Mm-hmm. So, and once you've made the decision to go for treatment, I would imagine it's hard to put into your mind, well, now I need to, you know, check on this place and make sure they're going to do what they say and that they have everything I need. And it, it's, it just sounds like a fraught time in your life. And yeah. uh, you can understand not being able to do that. Um, yeah. And at like 17, 18 years old, that's not like right. the all the questions that you're asking either too. So like those are the questions that came down from other people as well that I had the years after to think about. Right. Right. Yeah. Hey, I have to, I have to ask you, you didn't mention diabolemia in your email and I heard you, you've struggled to it through this first half an hour. Like you wanted to tell me, but you, you had trouble getting it out a couple of different times. So I want to check, are you okay? That you just said something I think you weren't sure you were going to say today. Is that right? Oh, I didn't mention it all in the email at first, but I had, well, since I had time um, from when we scheduled the meeting to think about all the things that I wanted to say. Um, But when I was listening to some of the podcasts from the beginning, there was a woman who said that she had a lot of struggles. It was one of the earlier um, podcasts. I wanted to go back and look at it. I think it was in like in the early 200s, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, But she said that she had struggled with it a lot and she had suffered from a lot of complications. And that was actually one of the reasons why I was just like, okay, time to get into action, time to get myself together. And um, I just think that sharing the struggles will help people who might be too afraid to come out and say things to really like realize that they're not alone because a lot of the people who shared their stories in the podcast were brave enough to come out and say their story. And like, I was one of those people for a really long time to not come out and say anything. And then I saw that there are people out there who are not doing well, like I wasn't doing well. And I'm not alone and other people out there are not alone and it does get better. Yeah. It's your turn to be brave. That's all, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's, it's really nice that you're sharing it. So tell me a little bit about what people should be looking for. So if I'm a parent of someone or if I'm an adult living with type one, how does diabolemia rear its head originally? How did it start for you? Um, a lot of the signs are definitely, um, decrease in like renewing prescriptions for sure. And so like, if you notice that there's a lot of, like, if your child is saying like, oh yeah, I'm definitely doing what I'm supposed to. Like I'm doing it all the insulin, like I'm card counting, I'm doing my insulin, blah, blah, blah. But you're noticing that you're not refilling prescriptions often as you usually are. That's a, a huge sign. Okay. Um, I did that a lot. And um, another one is you are noticing that the A1C is really high every time you go to the endocrinologist, but the meter is always saying a number that doesn't reflect the A1C. There's like definitely number manipulation where they'll, um, they'll take insulin and then change the date and time on the meter and then just check their blood sugar over and over again and change the date and time on the meter. Um, that sounds like so much work tonight. (laughs) <laughs> it's a lot of work. Trust me. I spent a lot of time doing that and it was not a lot of fun. Can I ask you, is it more work keeping your A1C where it is now or more work pretending that you have a good A1C? Oh, it's so much more work pretending. It is so much more work yeah. because you have this constant fear where you're like, someone's going to find out, but like, I need to do like, it's, it's a constant battle all the time. Cause you're like, it's all psychological. It's in your head. And you're like, 
I have to do this because like in order for me to be the way that I need to be, like it's it's not you taking over. Like you think you're in control, but you're really not. Yeah. And you're like, I'm trying to tell everybody that this is the way that it is, but it's really not. Like and yeah. then it catches up to you and it's just it just all falls apart. And so Cause... honestly you feel better, you look better, you act better if you just are in control of your numbers the right way than if you're controlling the numbers the wrong way. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but a number of times while we've been talking, you've alluded to or flat out said that um, the way you are, you didn't know about someone else had to tell you. So when you were diagnosed, you didn't know how you felt someone, you don't remember how you felt someone told you how you felt. And even now, I, I what I'm hearing is, is that, is that you're, you're, you were never really being yourself. You were being what you thought you were supposed to be or what someone told you were supposed to be. Um, did, did you lose a lot in that gap of time? Like, are you able to look back now and like, I don't, I don't want to be a bummer, but what? Was there a lot of wasted life in there? Oh, yeah. There's definitely a lot of time that was spent trying to kind of keep up something that wasn't really the way that it was supposed to be. You know, like yeah. being being what I thought I was supposed to be. Well, not, maybe not supposed to be, but like being the way that I thought I wanted to be was a lot more than it should have been. And it took a lot more than it needed to. So a lot of effort to create appearances and you're not even necessarily sure that's how you really wanted to be to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know it's just, it's, it's, it feels convoluted, but it's, it's not really, it's to me, I, I've said it here before. One of the things I hate, I hate a lot of things and, you know, wasted time is one of them. I genuinely hate the idea of wasting time. I yeah. hate when there are a group of people together, um, three people, let's say. One person is lying. The other two people know they're lying but don't say anything to them. And we stand in this circle having this completely bogus conversation that not one person believes in. But we're doing it for appearances or we're doing it to set something up or I, I'm frustrated by that kind of thinking to begin with. Like I'm almost I'm almost angry at the person who you used to be for like like doing that with the yeah. meter. And yet I know it happens to so many people. It is such a mm -hmm. common story of fixing the meter, making it look right, just so you can go to the doctor, just to keep the doctor from yelling at you. Is that mm -hmm. a, a, or from oh, your, yeah. Or from and like I knew know. that yeah. it was wrong too. Like I knew that what I what I was doing was shouldn't I shouldn't have been doing, but there was just like some sort of fear or something surrounded by it. Like I had this constant need to be perfect all the time. And the sight of the numbers just being high was like I just can't even look at it. And like I didn't want to do it. So then Every time I saw a high number, I just didn't want to do it and I didn't want to see it. So then I would just avoid it and I would avoid checking my blood sugar until maybe like a week before. And then I would go back and just refabricate all those numbers. And then I would go in, they would check my A1C and they'd be like, well, we don't understand what's wrong. And then they'd be like, well, maybe it's the meter. We'll give you a new one. And I was like, yeah, maybe that's it. And like, I just was like, I couldn't really come to terms with myself yeah. in knowing the fact that I just needed to do it. And like, I knew that I needed to, but I just couldn't get myself to. Now, if you, so first of all, please understand, and I'm sure you do, because you're, you're, we're having a nice conversation here and you're, you're, mm -hmm. really, you're really cool, but I don't, I didn't mean like angry at you, like, like at you. I meant I'm, I'm angry to think that you wasted time 
Oh, and, yeah. Right. And, and and that other people are doing the same thing. And not even just with, I mean, yours is obviously, you know, it's its own little criminal enterprise with changing the numbers and the dates on things and testing mm-hmm. when you know you're low and changing dates. But even what the doctor's office did, like, come on. Like, how many times does the doctor's office need to see an A1C that's 11 and a meter that says your A1C is 6? And they know, too. So now yeah. they know, you know, they're handing you a new meter, like, oh, maybe it's this. And you're like, yeah, maybe. You're literally in the scenario that I painted where everyone's just full of shit and we're acting yeah. like it's okay. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a strange thing to me. Really frustrating. Um, Mm -hmm. away from diabetes even, because I, I so much prefer directness and, and competency because look, I mean, look what happened to you. You just randomly found a podcast Mm -hmm. and your A1C is what now? I think the last time I checked it was 7.1. Jesus, that's so great. Good for you. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And, and, and what's the difference between this whole nine years and a 7.1? The podcast, honestly. Yeah, but, yeah, but, but. Honestly, just like growing up and realizing that if I want to be the best version of myself, it's just like, you know what you need to do. You have the things that you need in order to do them. So why not just do it? It's yeah. easier to do it than to not. It's easier to take the steps than to avoid it. And you feel better. You know what it's like to feel better. You, you've been there before. So just but do you, it. <laughs> but back then, you couldn't accomplish it though, right? Like, Or could you have and you just didn't? I could have. And I had done it before. I had gotten my A1C down before. I had gotten it to a nine before. And that was the best I'd ever felt in a really long time. I think it was like my summer going into sophomore year of college i had started a new like workout program and i was going to like this boot camp type workout thing and um i started like a meal plan and it had changed my numbers a lot and it was working out really well and my a1c went down just from like changing my diet and exercise routine. And um, after that, I was like, oh, I can actually do this. So then I just started doing it. And then I got back to college and everything kind of just like went a little bit haywire. And I kind of fell back into the um, – the di- diabolema mentality where like the insulin restriction actually helped me lose weight more. And it kind of just the psychological aspect of that kind of crept back in and the numbers just went back up and it didn't really stick. So so the for, bad habits just kind of started back up again. So then for you, the podcast was more about the the psychological side of diabetes, not so much about the nuts and bolts, yeah. how to use insulin side of it. Yeah. Yeah. You because the, the, the technical aspect of diabetes has always come very straightforward to me. Like I've always understood the, you take the insulin and then you eat the food and it works like that. Like it's straightforward mathematics, science. It works like that. It ebbs and flows like it's straightforward like that. But the mentality, like the psychological aspect behind it has always been the struggle for me. I and I know that with a lot of people too, like especially just from listening to a lot of the podcasts and um that's always been the hard part. Yeah. You, you, I hope you understand that that's not how I think of it. Even like, I know the podcast does that for you and for people in your situation, but it's Mm -hmm. not why I started it. It, I really did start it. Like in my mind, this podcast is about using insulin, but to you, it's not really about that at all. And that's really cool and fascinating to me that, that it, and, and so the aspect of having, 
average people in to talk about their diabetes, that's been the real value for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. All right. I understand. I, you're helping me. Thank you. Uh, you're you're helping me understand what it does because I come from such a. I don't have diabetes, obviously. So mm-hmm. my my perspective is more. Um, I don't even know how to say it. It's 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 less encumbered by the the psychology of having type one, honestly. You know, and 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 the everything else that comes with having diabetes. But I I can understand it enough to know what the show needs to be, um, and having just pe- people on who don't have you know you know blogs and you know I've been writing about diabetes for fifteen years like I I find it boring to talk to those people because they have yeah. they have a um, uh, they've got talking points and they just they just they hit them they know how to go through them like if you had me on a podcast. And the podcast is about, you know, making a podcast. If I started Mm -hmm. telling my story, I would get very cookie cutter too, because I've told it a thousand times. I've had to tell it to every advertiser that, you know, is interested in being on this show. Like I had to have a conversation last night for an hour with a potential advertiser that likely won't turn into anything, but I still had to do the thing and explain the story and do all that. And so I don't like to have people on who know their story so well that there's no chance that they'll say something spontaneous and honest like you did today. Yeah. Like it's almost scripted, right? It comes off very, very, it's nothing against those people. I I know a lot of them and they're lovely. And there are times where I think that those people must be so pissed at me, you you know, like that that (laughs) I've never invited them on the show because some of them I really like, but they just, I don't know. They're, they're in a lane and they do a thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I want you to like, I'm telling you, you said I've had struggles. You you said it three times before you basically copped to having diabulimia at one point. Yeah. And and that to me is so valuable for people listening because other people who have diabulimia who don't tell anybody can understand how you feel. And then they can hear that it worked out well for you and that you overcame this hurdle that probably seemed insurmountable, I would imagine. You know, that whole time, like, did you really ever think you were going to get over this? I never thought I would, honestly. And I know, like, there, it's always good to have a support system for sure. And I did have people that I think were good support, but in, if I'm being honest, I really think that I got through it by myself. Like, Mm -hmm. a lot of it I did on my own. And, that's not something a lot of people like to admit. Like I definitely don't like that. I did that on my own and it was definitely really hard. Like diabetes is hard. Diabetes is hard. And like going through alone is hard. And why I definitely didn't go through it like 100% alone, but you felt when, when you felt alone. Yeah, definitely. And like, Especially, like, I don't know anybody else who has diabetes. Like, I'm the only person in my family who has it. I don't I don't have any friends who have it. I've heard of people who, like, I have friends who have friends who have it, but I don't know anybody personally who has it. Mm-hmm. And that definitely was, like, a factor of, like, feeling alone in it as well. And so when I found the podcast, I was like, I'm not alone. Like there are people out there who are going through the same thing as I am. And it helped me like kind of flip the switch and be like, I can, like, if all these people can do it, like, so can I. And it just really like kind of made, helped me make that 180 and realize that like, if there's, if there's a way out, then I have to take the steps to do it, even if I am going to do it by myself. Like I can, like I can do it. And if there are people out there who feel like they're alone, like, trust me, you're not like, I felt like I was like, you are definitely not alone. And it may feel like that in a world of so many people doing so many different things, like going through so many different things, but, but there are people out there going through something just as similar as you are. And Trust me, like if you can, if you feel like 
any part of you wants to get through it, just cling on to that and you will get through it. Like I did it in a matter of months, which I did not think would ever happen, but I'm here now and I'm doing great. So well, that's so, you probably, you know, matter of months, you, you did it. It took you 10 years and you yeah, know, you got true, yeah. one more piece and that kind of took you over the finish line is, is, you know, really the way I would think of it. I wouldn't think of it as you found some magic. It's just maybe the podcast was just the last piece that you needed. There are plenty of people who are have your situation but are in a different portion of their journey who find the mm-hmm. podcast and it doesn't come together for them as quickly. And um, I, I think that's important to say too because sometimes I hear people say, well, I don't get it. There was a guy on the podcast that he found the podcast and three months later his A1C was six. And I listened for three months and that didn't happen to me. And I'm, yeah. I'm like, well, it's not going to happen the same for everybody. Everybody's at the different uh, in a different part of their journey, and and you know this piece is important, I think. But if you're not ready to receive it, it's tough uh, to just put it into practice and expect it to work. I, I wondered while you were talking, is it possible that I can that a person can be supported, meaning they have family around them who you know would do anything for you, so you're not really alone in that sense, yet you still feel alone? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. My, I definitely have my family, my, I have a lot of family who was in the medical field too. So they get an understanding of it. And I guess they have like the silent support, I guess, where they're there for me and they'll support me. But I guess I just didn't necessarily like, no, I guess I wasn't like super aware of it, or maybe I just didn't really like think of it like that. Um, Let let me ask you a question and see if this strikes a chord with you. And if it doesn't, that's fine. But I use this as an example all the time. So when I started the podcast, I was very clear that I was going to share how we reached the success that my daughter had. And a person, a, a specific person in the community admonished me about it. They listened to the podcast reached out without asking if I was interested in their opinion to tell me that I was doing the wrong thing and that I shouldn't be doing what I was doing. I shouldn't be sharing how I manage my daughter. And they told me it was wrong. And I, and I just, I was admonished by this person and mm-hmm. I, it sticks with me to this day because of how wrong they were, but of how, how right they thought they were in the moment. So, mm-hmm. sh- so sure that no one should share how they manage their diabetes because Everyone's different and your diabetes may vary. And I was back there going like, no, no, no. There are simple truths about diabetes that apply to everyone. And if they just understood this piece of it and this piece of it, et cetera, et cetera, then it would, they could make sense of it and decide what parts of what works for my daughter would work for them. And, Mm -hmm. but it was, it wasn't lazy, I don't think, but it was just such a self-righteousness that you're doing, you know, being told you're doing the wrong thing. And now I look back and I think, what if I would have listened to that person? Like, what if I would have let them scare me away from doing this? Like, honestly, mm-hmm. that that person seven or eight years ago now was attempting to do something that Danae would have left your A1C over 10 for the rest of your life. And yeah. and 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 I don't think we we just don't think enough about our actions sometimes or how sure we can be about something and that maybe someone else might have a different idea. And I just heard you saying that you're, you just said something, the the way I should say this is, is that you just said something that made me realize that all the people I've ever spoken to who are adults with diabetes, I'm always trying to get them to say what happened so that other people will know. And it's always my thought that they weren't supported by their parents. And I think that management wise, a lot of them weren't, but they can never say it. Like you have, you, you, they can never say it out loud because they don't want to denigrate their parents. That's one Mm -hmm. thing. Like a lot of people just don't want to throw somebody under the bus, but also you felt supported by your parents, just not in a way that was going to lead you to outcomes that were better for your health. So it just occurred to me that you're not protecting them. You honestly feel good about their support. It just wasn't in its entirety everything you needed. Is that all fair? 
Yeah, I think that's pretty fair. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, You really just, you said something in a way recent, just like I said, a couple of minutes ago that made me rethink a lot of answers that I've heard on the podcast. Um, It just, it just now is making sense to me. It's not that those people weren't helping them. They weren't doing the things that they, that the, that the person with type one specifically needed to have better outcomes. So they were being supported, but not in the way that often the podcast ends up supporting them. Yeah. Like there was, there was support, but maybe not in the way that could have best benefited me. So this is what people mean when they say you can be in a room full of people and feel alone. Yes. This mm-hmm. is it. Okay. There's like, it's like you're, you're being helpful, but you're not helping. Yes. And, and, and back to my original rambling point is that I, I'll say to people all the time, like, I think it's important to share what works for us on the podcast because it's nice to hear you're not alone at three o'clock in the morning when your blood sugar's low, but wouldn't it be nicer to understand how to get your basal set up so that you actually aren't low at three o'clock in the morning so that, mm-hmm. it, so that you don't need that you're not alone support. Like the, it's not that the you're not alone support isn't really valuable, but in my mind it was, wouldn't it be better if you didn't need it as often? Mm-hmm. And that's the point I tried to make to that person back then. And they just said, no, you're doing the wrong thing. And I think yeah. I've never really like had this uh, feeling out loud. Uh, but to that person, uh, f- you. there you go. Right tonight. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I knew I knew what I was talking about. Hey, but of course, <laughs> I, the irony here, of course, today is that person thought they knew what they were talking about. And it, it's just perspective. Because what they really meant was, if they were to share what they knew, they thought it would be dangerous for other people to hear. And Mm -hmm. I felt pretty confident that I could deliver the information in a way that would make it digestible and actionable. Yeah. That's all. I actually think this might be one of my greater accomplishments of my life. Just learning how to talk about diabetes in a way that people could understand it. And I, I seriously, like, I, 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 if I die tomorrow, just say that at my funeral, I'd be completely happy. Scott was a father and a husband, and he tried really hard to help people with type 1 diabetes. I think I would be, that'd be an okay uh, eulogy for me. Um, I think that last sentence should be, he did really well in helping a lot of people in diabetes. Did you just correct my grammar, Danae? What just happened there? Or no, did no, you, oh, okay. I mean, I wasn't you so... tried, but no, you did. Oh, oh, okay. I thought it was like, hey, I was like, <laughs> I, I don't need this pressure from you today. I never did well in school. And now you're <laughs> no, like, you conjugated the wrong word. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, that's that, that that's even debatable. It worked for you and it works for some people. It works for a lot of people, but it probably doesn't work for everybody. And there are a couple of reviews on the podcast. Right? People hate me. You, you know what I mean? Like I get that I'm not everybody's cup of tea and all. That's fine. Uh, but I just thought it was worth trying. Like what was the harm in trying? Everybody always acted like there was harm in trying. And I've known people in the past who've had major sway. Like, you know, we talk about, uh, I don't like the word influencer. Um, and I don't, mm-hmm. I don't think of myself in that vein. But there are plenty of people now, like Instagram is a good example. Like, I'm an influencer. I'm like, I don't, are you? Like, aren't you just a guy that looks nice in jeans and it has a good smile <laughs> who happens to have diabetes? Does that make you a diabetes influencer? You, you know, like, I don't, I don't understand that specifically. Yeah. I don't understand the idea of wanting to influence somebody either. Like, I don't, like, for me, it's about, I have a message. Here it is. I hope it works for you. And yeah, you're just talking and some people like to listen. That's that, really yeah, that that's exactly how I think of it. It's just it's up to you to pick it up or put it down and it doesn't it, it I mean it doesn't not matter to me, but I mean I'm not hurt if you don't like the podcast. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's the only thing I can do. I'm not trying to make a thing that I think you'll be preconceived predetermined to like. Mm-hmm. I just this is the thing I have and you'll you know, you'll do with it what you want. I'm excited that it helped you. Yeah. Really, this has been yeah. It's been it's been a really great help. It's changed a lot for me. So cool. It's really kind of you to share. You you said you had, did you have any other troubles that beyond diabulimia that are worth sharing? Um, or was that the big impediment? Yeah, that's probably the biggest one. But just like 
really well I recently got the Omnipod I don't well there's never been really any struggles with the Omnipod but like that's probably the best thing that I've gotten I got it actually the day after my 24th birthday which was like the best thing that has ever happened in terms of diabetes for me so that's not a struggle but that's a good thing good. um hey can I ask you did you get it by first trying a free no obligation demo and did you go to um, I had Omnipod? one but I actually never put it on because I already knew that I didn't wanted I, didn't it. I, didn't I try again? So, didn't I try again? Did you use the link omnipod.com forward slash juice box to get a free no obligation demo of the Omnipod? I did use <laughs> the link. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jesus. Try a little harder, would you? My gosh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how did you know you wanted the pump? Um, so I actually had wanted it for a while. Back in high school, I um, asked uh, for it because I had been using, I started off with the syringes and then I moved to the pens and I had been using the pens for a really long time. And then I was like, I really don't want to use these anymore. And so I had spoken to my endocrinologist about it and they were like, well, your A1C is too high for it. And I was like, oh, that's weird. Okay. So then I was trying to get it down and then they were like, okay, we'll do like a class on it. And then I just never got around to it. And then once I started hearing the podcast and how well it worked for people, um, I had changed endocrinologist. Um, Good for you. Because that other one said oh, stupid yeah. stuff to you. Like your A1C is too high for a pump. I never understand that. Yeah, I was a little bit thrown by that. And she was also the pediatric endocrinologist. Um, but then I had changed, um, I think, in December, I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, I had one previously, but I didn't really see her that often because I just was avoiding all of that and didn't really like hospitals. So I didn't go. And um, so then I changed to one who I now love. He is so smart, super nice. And it actually like cares about what I have to say. And when I told him about your podcast, he was like, I'm going to listen to it. And so he listens to you actually now, which is pretty cool. What's his name? And, um, so then I was like, yeah, I really want to get on the pump. It's going to help a lot. And he was like, yeah, I definitely will. And then I started it in August and um, that like completely changed the A1C too. So it's really good. Good for you. Um, What's your doctor's name? Uh, Scott Sperling. Scott? Thank you for listening. This is very nice. <laughs> Scott, and thank yeah. you for being progressive enough to let Danae have a pump. Um, you know, you have uh, something else in common with Omnipod. You're both there in Massachusetts. Yes, we are. Yeah. I visited last year. I gave a I gave a talk to the employees at the the um, the building where uh, some of the offices are and where they actually make the pods. Mm -hmm. And I got to take a tour of the production facility, which is fascinating because it's oh, that's pretty cool. Run by robots and everything. It is very very neat. Um, awesome. just very cool. But yeah, you guys have that, uh, in common. Uh, you're right up there in mass, uh, a place where it snows and becomes, uh, uninhabitable for human life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then it's like warm the next day. <laughs> well, that's global warming. Uh, but, <laughs> but th true. that, that horror that is cold weather in, especially in, in the Boston area right there, mm -hmm. it's, it's unholy the way it comes off the water like that and just, crushes the area in that cold it's uh oh my gosh i don't know how you live there it's amazing i don't know either <laughs> i've been trying to leave for so long <laughs> because of the cold yes i cannot get myself to get out of here but i've been trying <laughs> have you ever heard sam fold on the show sam used to be a professional baseball player and he's a coach now for the phillies mm -hmm. uh, he was up for the um the head coaching job in boston just recently and it went to someone else, and I sent him a simple text that said, too cold there anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because uh, uh, nobody uh, – it's just – I don't know how you guys do it. It's fascinating. It's cold here, but Boston is uh, – it's frigid there uh, yeah. in the wintertime. Okay, so is there anything that we have not covered that you wish that we would? 
Um, I think that's all. Not bad. I thought you were great. I really appreciate you coming on and doing this. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for having me. Seriously. This all started with you just wanting to make fun of Kim Kardashian. And then I know I, when I saw that, I was like, terrible. What a bad influence. Now that's an influencer. I do not agree Today with. Today just sends me a picture of Kim Kardashian checking her ketones, which I guess is something people do that don't have diabetes. I probably around dieting reasons, if I'm guessing. Yeah. And, something about ketosis. Yeah. And, and she's, she's like the first paragraph of your email is like, look at this. <laughs> and then the, I was horrified. <laughs> and then the rest of it. And, and I think you were one of those people, you, you weren't really looking to be on the show as much as did I push you back or were you hoping to be on? I can't tell. People are so polite when they email sometimes. I think I'm not even sure if they want to be on. My wife says I'm not good at reading signals from people, but. <laughs> I just emailed and I just wanted to thank you for everything that you do on the podcast. And you're like, if you want to come on, you can. And I was like, oh, really? Wow. I was not expecting that. Okay, sure. <laughs> There's something about what you said that made me think that it would be a good idea to have you on. And look, I was right. Just like I was oh, right I, all those years I ago. I think is, um, I did mention, um, I don't know if this was it or not, but um, I'm planning on going to school to become an endocrinologist, actually, for um, to help with uh, type 1 diabetics. I went to school for nutrition and um want to specialize in like nutrition for diabetics and everything. So, so wait, so you, you want to become a doctor or you want to do nutrition for people with type one? I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I want to become a doctor. Um, but I went to school for nutrition and, um, I'm going to go to, um, back to become a dietitian and then go to school to become an endocrinologist. Oh. Good luck with that. That's amazing. I, I need more doctors on my side. So that's a good idea. As a matter of fact, everyone listening should become an endocrinologist. We can fix this whole thing right now. Start talking to people differently about their their diabetes. Give them a better chance. That's all. That's my marching orders for everybody today. <laughs> Quit <laughs> well, your jobs and become in, doctors. <laughs> uh, 12 years and I'll be on your show again for uh, endocrinology. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll keep it going that long just to hear that story. I really will. Okay. That's that's. I just told somebody the other day. They're like, "When do you think the podcast is ending?" And I was like, "Uh, never. If I can help it, you, never." You know? <laughs> so, um, that's really great. Then I thank you so much for coming on and doing this. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Hold on one second, please. I'm starting the recording back up. I don't usually do this, but wait. So you okay. you you can speak French. So like, could you say, um, like I have type one diabetes in French. Uh, j'ai diabète, uh, type one, <laughs> type un. Do other words, like, can you say you're listening to the Juice Box podcast? Tu écoutes le podcast de Juice Box. Oh. Box. Wait, I talked over you. Do it again. Tu écoutes le podcast de Juice Box. That's so much fun for me for reasons <laughs> that I can't put into words. <laughs> so you, can you have full conversations in French and, or does it go away if you don't use it? Yeah, I, I speak with my mom a lot. Um, it's a little rusty right now just because I haven't been there in a little while. The last time I went, I was in um, September of 2019. Mm -hmm. So once yeah. you, so you go back to France and then it takes a couple of days and then it's back? Yeah, it kind of refreshes after like a day or so. That's really cool. um, but I try to keep up with it as much as I can. I watch a lot of French shows, um, so just to like kind of keep up, and I speak with my mom when I can. That's excellent. Yeah, I definitely would not want to lose that skill. I took French for three years in high school and know no French whatsoever, so <laughs> very proud of myself. I believe at one point I could count to eight. <laughs> just eight. <laughs> it wasn't for me. Uh, <laughs> you can't get those last two numbers? Um. Not is, to ten. <laughs> is, wait, is Nuf nine? Yes. Cat sank. What is that? Five. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is ten. This. Yeah, I was terrible. Like uh, whatever, my brain did not work that way. I literally sat through three years of French class, and I, I couldn't speak three words of French. My brain just doesn't <laughs> like. Trust me, the fact that I teach anybody anything is. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, it's the grammar that will get you. 
Oh, That's please. I never even got far enough into it to understand that part of it. I just, my <laughs> brain just does not, it just, I couldn't pick it up. It, to me, math and French were the same thing. I just, I don't, I don't understand things that don't, I don't know. I can't even put into words for you why I don't understand it. Um, but I can't understand algebra and I could not learn to speak another language. So I feel that silly. Now. <laughs> I can talk about pre bowls thing though. So, all right. Yeah, all right. Yeah. That's the easy stuff. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Just understanding when to put this in and how long to wait and then when to do this, that I get, uh, the rest of it, not so much. Okay. I, I kept you too long. I'm sorry. I, I will, uh, no, okay. I appreciate this. Thank you again. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Hey, hey, was Danae not amazing? Danae, everybody round of applause. You should be clapping to at home. Thanks so much to Dexcom, makers of the G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor, and Omnipod, makers of the Omnipod Dash Tubeless Insulin Pump, for sponsoring this episode. Go to Omnipod.com forward slash juice box and Dexcom.com forward slash juice box to find out more about these amazing products and to support the Juice Box podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget there's a new show every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. 